This one might have been the final straw. Did today's featured album really break up one of Rock's most revered bands forever? Yeah, the answer to this one kind of hurts. On this episode, we're zeroing in on the moment when it all hit the fan. The point in no return, when the world was robbed of one of the most talented bands ever put to vinyl. With one band member already kicked to the curb, two more were then marginalized until they had no voice at all. This left only one man standing. That is until his bandmates completely turned the tables later on. But sadly for the world, there was no winners here, as we've had to endure decades of shots fired ever since. It's a cautionary tale about when the best of bands go bad. From Juggernaut to Fallen Heroes, this story's coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember Woodsy Owl and Smokey the Bear back in the day, <laughs> you're gonna dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Also check us out on Patreon to get more content. It helps us to keep it a daily channel and you can become an honorary producer to help us curate this history, it's so important. Man, today is a tough episode to recount. The story of the record that severed one of history's greatest bands. So after the ouster of keyboardist Rick Wright and the global triumph of The Wall, Pink Floyd was down to the primary trio of bassist Roger Waters, guitarist David Gilmore, and drummer Nick Mason. The 70s had been a tumultuous decade for intraband relations, and as they pushed ahead into the 80s, things were only gonna get a whole lot worse. The Wall, Floyd's final 70s work, was released at the precipice of the decade. Actually, on November 30th, 1979, a lot of people forget that. Positioned as it was, the single spilled into the 80s. The epic 27-track double concept album featured three singles. Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, released on November 23rd, 1979. Run Like Hell, released in April of 1980. And of course, Comfortably Numb. That one dropped on June 23rd, 1980. Two years after the release of The Wall in November of 1981, Pink Floyd issued a compilation album with the tongue-in-cheek title, A Collection of Great Dance Songs. Of course, the name referenced both another Brick in the Wall's disco influence and Nick Mason's snide remark that Pink Floyd's US label probably thought that they were a dance band. Hey, if Sheep and Wish You Were Here are not great dance tracks, then I don't know what is. <laughs> Now, pushing ahead to 1982, Pink Floyd got to work on their 12th studio album, The Final Cut. Though I need to use the band's name loosely here, because The Final Cut was all but a Roger Waters solo record. I'll get to that in a minute. The Final Cut was first conceived as a soundtrack album for Pink Floyd, The Wall, a 1982 film based on The Wall, uh, which was promised in the movie's closing credits, if you remember. Under the working title, Spare Bricks, the album was meant to feature new music re-recorded for the film, like when the Tigers broke free. Roger Waters also planned to record other tracks that would expand the Wall's narrative from there. However, Roger Waters decided there really wasn't enough new material in the movie to make an interesting record, so he pulled the plug on the concept and he started reworking the album to something altogether different. With the recent events of the Falklands War serving as a backdrop, uh, Roger Waters visualized a new album whose main character was an ex-military man returning home from the war. Overwhelmingly traumatized, the traumas of war. Yeah, that wasn't exactly new territory for Roger Waters, but hey, right, what well, you know, I guess, right? Incidentally, this veteran was none other than the school teacher from the walls, the happiest days of our lives, you know, of Hey, teacher, leave them kids alone, fame. The 12th Pink Floyd album, that would be another homage to Waters' father as a no-holds-barred attack on Margaret Thatcher and the world's conservative leaders of the time, if you read into it. As the final cut was Pink Floyd's first album without Rick Wright, 
He was replaced on keyboards by Michael Kamen and Andy Bowne. Even more important to note, this was the last record on which Waters, Gilmore, and Mason would all work on together. For years, Roger Waters had been pushing into reality his inner narrative that he was the be-all and end-all of Pink Floyd. I mean, there's no arguing that at that time he was the conceptual mastermind behind The Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here and Animals and The Wall. I mean, his talent for creating conceptual lyrics and messaging, it's almost unmatched. But carrying the mantle of Pink Floyd on his shoulders all alone? It's a far-fetched claim. I'll always argue that David Gilmour was equally as vital from a sonic perspective. And likewise, it would be criminal to discount Mason and Wright's contributions on those albums. Out there in the cold. Truth is, Roger Waters was getting too big for his britches. I mean, all you needed to do is read the back of the sleeve of the final cut to figure that out. It says a requiem for the post-war dream by Roger Waters, and below that performed by Pink Floyd. This album was definitely a requiem, but not in the way that Roger Waters envisioned. Far from a collaborative effort, the final cut was Roger Waters' baby, as David Gilmour would put it. The bassist composed all 13 tracks and sang alone on each and every one. The exception of Not Now John, which was in part performed by Gilmore. Said Nick Mason, and I quote, David wanted time to produce some material of his own, but Roger, now totally motivated by his project, was not interested in waiting. Furthermore, Roger Waters was preoccupied with controlling uh, the purse strings as well telling Mason that since he was just a drummer, he had no claim or any extra credits or royalties. This even though Nick spent a load of time creating and recording sound effects for this album, for many others. As it was, the final cut shifted David Gilmore and Nick Mason into the role of a supporting cast, if you can imagine it. Essentially session musicians in studio and a would-be backing band on stage. That is, if there had been a tour. With more than a little snark, David Gilmore later said, and I quote, if Waters ever needed a guitarist to give him a call. Initially, Gilmore and Waters worked together in the studio, and as a point of camaraderie, they even played the Nintendo classic Donkey Kong together in their spare time. But as time passed and the tension mounted, it was on like Donkey Kong. Sorry, couldn't resist. The two had to be separated. Really, the band needed a good therapy session to work through things, but that would not happen. You know, speaking of therapy, let's talk about today's sponsor. No matter your age, gender, income, or career, we all have those moments when the stress and the strain of a very busy lifestyle can negatively affect our mental health. Sometimes you need someone to chat with for a little one-on-one -on -one therapy, but a close friend or family member is not always an ideal sounding board. Sometimes you don't want to appear weak or vulnerable to them and confiding in an unbiased listener is much more comfortable. For my situation, I found today's sponsor BetterHelp to be an easy way to connect with someone to just vent and clear my head. At BetterHelp, I can get matched with an actual licensed therapist who will truly listen and give me helpful, unbiased advice. BetterHelp is an excellent alternative to in-person therapy because you can schedule a session whenever you want it. I don't have to worry about when the therapist is available or even drive to an office. Online therapy platforms such as online messaging, live chats, phone calls, or video sessions are available through your computer or your phone even. If you need a little stress reliever and therapy in your life, I recommend you visit betterhelp.com forward slash professor of rock or choose professor of rock during sign up for a special discount off your first month of therapy. So back to Pink Floyd. So David Gilmour was exasperated with the political bent in Waters lyrics which he'd been peddling really since Animals in 1977. In Gilmore's opinion, the highly volatile brand of political lyricism was detrimental to the music. Plus, David was always music first anyway. And this time around, he was thoroughly opposed to the production choices that Waters was making for the record. He even asked to have his name removed from the production credits. Further annoying Gilmore was the fact that Waters was systematically dredging up songs he had composed for the last album. Songs that the band had collectively rejected. They weren't good enough for the album. Said David, and I quote, 
Songs that we threw off the wall, he brought them back for the final cut. Same songs. Nobody thought they were that good then. What makes them that good now? End of quote. Four pieces in particular left Gilmore just seething. Your possible pass, one of the few, the final cut, and the hero's return. They were all lifted out of the scrappy. Of the possible future. When you're one of the few. So the And the guitarists didn't think they were up to snuff for the band. David admitted to losing his temper on more than one occasion. And though there were no fisticuffs, as it were, it almost reached that point on a couple of occasions. Waters, for his part, could read the writing on the wall. He said, By the time we had gotten a quarter of the way through making the final cut, I knew that I would never make another record with David Gilmore and Nick Mason. We just didn't agree on anything anymore. End of quote. So by December 1982, Roger Waters had effectively forced Gilmore and Mason to give up any control that they had over this project. Band relations had officially reached the point of insolvency. And any goodwill within Pink Floyd, it was now bankrupt. This turn of events may have been a relief to Roger Waters, but for many Pink Floyd fandom across generations, this was the moment of ultimate tragedy. Because from here on out, Pink Floyd in its most creative form was effectively dead on arrival, with no promise of a resurrection. In 2002, Gilmore summed up the debacle, declaring that the album should have been called The Final Straw instead of The Final Cut. And in his book, Inside Out, Mason wrote that because of the tension, the very idea of doing another Floyd album after The Final Cut, it just seemed unthinkable. In a karmic twist, The Final Cut would be Roger Waters' final studio album under the name Pink Floyd released in Europe on March 21st of 1983. And then a few weeks later in America on April 2nd, the album gathered mixed reviews. Now Rolling Stone dubbed it Art Rock's crowning masterpiece. Rolling Stone's been wrong a lot. Melody Maker though called it a milestone in the history of awfulness. The British public gave the final cut top marks. It reached number one on the UK charts, although you could argue their album was riding the wave of really, you know, the wall the massive popularity of that album. In the States, though, the Pink Floyd name was enough to carry the album to number six on the Billboard 200, though it was a big fall from the genius of the previous album, for sure. When it comes down to it, the final cut is the prime example of what Pink Floyd sounds like when Roger Waters is left entirely to his own devices. It's hard to point to an essential track on the final cut for me, whereas Floyd's 70s catalog is overflowing with clear-cut winners. I mean, think Dark Side, Wish You Were Here, Animals, The Wall. It's easy to come up with a lengthy list of rock standards. These are perfect albums, for the most part. Perfect. Now, if you put the final cut next to it, it's just a painful juxtaposition. Even if it was still ahead of most of the rock outfits of the day. But with Floyd, we expected more. On the final cut, Roger Waters is the victim of his own hubris. Just as a comparative exercise, I mean, consider George Lucas's unrestrained power during the prequel era of Star Wars. There was no one to challenge his ideas, kind of on Indiana Jones as well. Excuse me. The final cut is much the same for Waters. Without checks and balances from talented creators, the results were, well, disappointing. How's that for a can of worms in the comments? Star Wars, George Lucas, prequels, go. <laughs> anyway, I think you get the idea. I mean, don't get me wrong. I still listen to the final cut and acknowledge its sordid place in Pink Floyd's history. But you have to take this one with a grain when calling it a Pink Floyd album, right? In the years that followed, Gilmore and Waters each took their fair share of shots at each other's work. Commenting on the final cut, David would say that there were only three good songs on the record. The Fletcher Memorial Home, The Final Cut, and uh, I can't remember the third one right now. There's two of them anyway. Those were his exact words. The record featured one single, the aforementioned Not Now John, which actually did have Gilmore on it. And that one's a really curious choice since it's one of the few Pink Floyd tracks to feature some really heavy hitting profanity, dropping the F-bomb multiple times on the album version for sure. For the single release, uh, the phrase F all that was overdubbed with stuff all that. Song made it to number 30 in the UK top 30, 
Uh, and number seven on the US mainstream rock charts, which I guess is good for a Pink Floyd single. Incidentally, some have wondered if the final cut is a sequel to The Wall. The simple answer is uh, no, right? Although clearly there are some pink-like connections and some common themes like alienation and war. At best, the final cut is a spiritual kin to The Wall, but doesn't exactly push the former album's narrative ahead any further like Waters originally envisioned. And worse, it has rejects from The Wall songs that weren't good enough for that particular record in the first place. That being said, a video of the final cut, 19 minutes in length, was shot by Willie Christie. It featured actor Alex McAvoy, uh, the same guy who played the teacher in The Wall. So there's that connection. Uh, the video features four songs, The Gunner's Dream, The Final Cut, Not Now John, and The Fletcher Memorial Home. So I know there's plenty of Pink Floyd drama and history in the years after the final cut, including multiple solo albums, but I want to skip ahead to 1987 and a momentary lapse of reason, because I think this album continues the argument over what constitutes a Pink Floyd album. We've covered this one in depth in a previous episode as well. Um, we also covered Learning to Fly in that episode. So I'll keep the background brief and I'll link to the in-depth episode below. When Nick Mason and David Gilmour decided to team up again in the mid 80s, Roger Waters had already put together a touring band and was doing shows with a lot of Pink Floyd classics. Waters never doubted for a second that he was Pink Floyd. And as you can imagine, this fueled more than a little rivalry within the drummer and the guitarist. In October of 85, Waters took out a high court application to block the Pink Floyd name ever being used again. David Gilmour argued that Roger didn't have the power to decide whether Pink Floyd worked again. And he made it known that he intended to continue with the band. Now, mind you, Waters, in disbelief, did all in his power to hasten the demise of the Pink Floyd name. Said Gilmore, Roger Waters declared Pink Floyd was over. I declared that it wasn't. Gilmore and Mason had no intention of abolishing Pink Floyd. And from their perspective, it wasn't Waters' decision to make on his own. When informed of David and Nick's plans to record another Pink Floyd album, Waters practically dared them to even try. He said, and I quote, you'll never do it. And you can imagine how that went over. Gilmore got so fired up over Waters' comments that he used them as a motivation to make a momentary lapse of reason. Said Mason, and I quote, Dave absolutely saw red and finally got it together to go back to work. They turned the tables on Waters and it worked to great effect. Critical to the album was the return of producer Bob Ezrin. He had co-produced The Wall, of course. Another unexpected and welcome addition was that of Rick Wright, whom Waters had previously kicked to the curb. Although, due to legal complications, he was paid as a salaried employee rather than an official member. It was three-fourths of Pink Floyd, a fair bit more than the one-fourth Floyd on the final cut. Just saying. Gilmore and company released a momentary lapse of reason in September of 1987, and the record soared to number three in both the UK and the US. All 11 tracks were composed entirely or in part by David Gilmore. Singles included One Slip, One slip the On the Turning Away, and Learning to Fly. The last two of those songs hit number one on the rock charts, and the album overall sold 10 million copies globally, or more than twice what the final cut did. No more Continuing the sniping, Waters said of the album's name, under the circumstances, it's a superb title for a so-called Pink Floyd record. Then more shots were fired when Waters also called the record a clever Pink Floyd forgery. But I guess all that was to be expected, right? It's Roger Waters. A case of sour grapes for sure, because Learning to Fly and On the Turning Away alone are classic Floyd. Then in 1988, the reunited trio issued the live set Delicate Sound of Thunder, and 1994 brought the division bell. The ring of the division bell had begun. Together, the post Waters Floyd albums outsold Roger Waters' solo materials by uh, quite a margin. 
So having laid out this complicated and really contentious history, which still continues to this day, where does that leave us? How do we answer the question, what constitutes a Pink Floyd record? Is seeing the name on the album enough? What do you think? Are tracks from the final cut and a momentary lapse of reason legitimate Pink Floyd songs? Are three out of four Floyds enough? Is one out of four too little? Which album do you like better, the final cut or a momentary lapse of reason or the division bell? Let's have a spirited debate in the section below. So to end on, I gotta throw this out. I've read this a couple places. I think it was in an interview like probably 30 years ago, 25 years ago. I've heard it a couple of times. I've discussed it with friends who love Floyd. There was a time, uh, I think it was during the Division Bell tour, Roger Waters was playing small theaters. This was before he took the, uh, the wall out. And, uh, you know, just down the road, Pink Floyd was playing a stadium. And he sat to regret thinking, what have I done? And I think that sums it up. Roger Waters is a genius, but he couldn't play nice with his comrades. Um, it's really kind of sad how this all ended up. Having said that, I gotta tell you, I'm so excited for David Gilmore's new solo record. Check out this song. The pipe is cold, contagious. I'm gonna link to it below, you gotta check it out. Bottom line, Roger Waters and David Gilmore are genius together. But I have to say, after the final cut and the legal wranglings and the smack talk, David Gilmore, Nick Mason, and Rick Wright more than held their own with two classic records in 1987 and 1994. We can always hold out hope for a reunion, but until then, we always have the music. Hey, thanks for watching. Leave us a comment about Pink Floyd, the final cut, and a momentary lapse of reason, and of course, the great Gilmore Waters divide. What are your thoughts and memories of Pink Floyd going from the 70s into the 80s and about this squabble? Gilmore's Pink Floyd, Roger Waters. Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.